I recently read a call for proposals from DARPA, a research agency of the U.S. Department of Defense. They're asking for submissions of ideas for, quote, growing biological structures of unprecedented size in microgravity, by which they mean up to 500 meters. Wild. I looked into it, and while I didn't find any plans to breed kilometer-sized aliens in space, unfortunately, it made me realize that I've totally underestimated the pace of the space race. There is so much more going on there than I knew. I read the DARPA call, and it turns out the Americans don't plan to hatch dragons in orbit. Rather, they think that some biologically grown materials could be useful in space. The examples that they name are tethers for a space elevator, grid nets for orbital debris remediation, or patch materials. I think the idea is to set up some sort of base station, which will then regularly be supplied with feedstock. That way you don't have to transport the entire product into space, but it assembles itself up there. DARPA also seems to include a bio-inspired self-assembly of mechanical structures, such as additional wings of a commercial space station or space-based interferometers. So these structures may not literally be alive, they may be produced by living organisms or be assembled like living organisms. It's not as crazy as it sounds at first. Indeed, they write in the proposal. Proposal, a relevant analogy is that of a tent, which may be the most efficient anti-hype sentence ever. In their analogy, the cover of the tent may be biologically grown. The reason they're interested in this is that it's easier to transport basic materials in small forms and sizes into space and assemble them up there. Better still if the assembly is done by robots or happens more or less automatically. If spiders can produce lots of silk, why can't we use a similar idea to produce space tethers? I mean, come on, giant spiders in space. How cool is that? Well, the biological part of this idea will take some more time to work out, but I was surprised to find that the mechanical self-assembly in space is much farther along than I thought. Multiple companies are already working on self-assembling space structures and they have something to show for, too. The first example I have is not a company. It's a non-profit organization called Aurelia Institute. They were founded in 2021 by alumni of MIT and SpaceX and are working on self-assembling and reconfigurable space habitats. These habitats build themselves from hexagonal elements that attach to each other. They already tested this idea with a small prototype in parabolic zero-g flights and also on the International Space Station to make sure that the assembly works properly. They yet have to bring the full-sized elements to space, but their plan is to get it done by the 2030s. They say that a habitat of 32 elements could host four people. You might say, well, you know, if you need to keep air inside, maybe it's not such a great idea to build it out of modular elements, and I hear you. But at least in the near future, most of the work up in orbit will probably not be done by humans anyway, but by robots. This brings me to another interesting example. That's the California-based startup Archisys. They've been around since 2018 and are also developing a modular orbital platform, but this one isn't meant for humans. They call it the port. The idea is that spacecraft land there, leave their payload and robots assemble it in space. Last year, they demonstrated that their robot can assemble a small satellite from parts in just one hour. The port is also modular and can grow itself, so to speak. And of course, there is Axiom Space that's developing the world's first commercial space station, Axiom Station. It's the planned successor to the International Space Station, which is scheduled to retire around 2030. Their plan is to first attach a new module to the ISS, currently scheduled for 2027. Then they want to increase the new part and in 2028 detach it from the ISS. The new station is designed not just for research and development but also space tourism. It features large windows, dynamic LED lightning, high-speed internet and a glass walled cupola for Earth viewing. Besides the companies working on habitats, there are also various startups that are developing 3D printers and assembly robots that can work in space. 
So I think where all of this is going is the real industry in space. And I've been surprised to see how far along some of those companies are already. Though personally, I think we should train tardigrades writing my startup pitch now. If you've ever felt hopeless about the state of the world, like no matter what you do, it's never enough to make a real difference, you're not alone. I felt that way too. But here's the good news. You can help and you don't even have to leave your couch to do it. This is thanks to my friends at Planet Wild. They're a community-powered nature protection group that takes action every month to restore ecosystems and protect wildlife. I joined last year and it's been amazing to see the impact we're making every month. And the best part? You can join in from the comfort of your home. Planet Wild is 100% transparent. Your money doesn't just disappear in a black hole. You see exactly exactly where your money goes. They document every mission with videos on YouTube and updates in their app so you can follow along in real time. Take their recent mission in Kenya. Lions were being killed by farmers because they were attacking livestock. Instead of conflict, Planet Wild introduced an ingenious solution. Solar-powered flashing lights that safely deter lions without harming them. And here is the best part. I'm covering the first month for the first 200 people who sign up using my QR code or link. No strings attached, you can cancel any time, but I have a feeling you'll love being part of this community. Thanks for watching, see you tomorrow.